So when a person goes into selling, does he have a job or is he in business or is he a professional? Yeah. yeah that's an interesting yeah. concept. Um, we have to examine those to see what the characteristics are of each and see how perhaps selling fits into that. Um, I know a job, for example, is fairly structured. In other words, you go to work at a certain time, they give you a 15 minute break in the morning, half an hour, 45 minutes for lunch, 15 minutes in the afternoon, and you quit at five. The work um, comes to you as yes, well. You're yes, told you're an accommodator. What to do. Mm -hmm. You betcha. You know, the work comes to you, and you have to accommodate that. Uh, there's not a lot of security, uh, typically, in a job because you can lose it very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, downsizing, capsizing, outsizing, whatever it happens to be. Which is funny because most people feel like a job is more secure mm -hmm. than, say, selling or some other. That's right. Because they know that every month they're going to get that check, mm -hmm. or they think they're going to. And they know what, how much it's going to be. Some of that still prevails. You know, it's kind of funny, but yet uh, we've done socioeconomic reviews in people's homes, and, and uh, there is a quiet desperation out there. Mm -hmm. They know somehow that it's not quite the way it was. And, uh, and yet they still cling to that possibility, and a person will lose a job, and they'll hunt for another one, not realizing that the same thing in all probability is going to happen again and again. I find it's also interesting that there tends to be uh, a desire or a willingness to blame the government or mm -hmm. the boss or all, all kinds of things right. other than maybe looking at themselves. And what I think one of the characteristics are. of a job, too, is you can lose it pretty easily by the whim of an individual, the stroke yeah. of a legislative pen, mm -hmm. uh, and by inconsistency. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a job and you go early and quick late, and try to make it up the next day by going early and staying late and then taking an hour's break instead of a half hour, that you're not going to be there very long. I mean, it's, yeah. that's going to end pretty quickly, and that's a, and probably appropriate. There's not a lot of flexibility. That's right. A job in one way, too, is where an individual has negotiated, essentially, away a big chunk of their life in exchange for a paycheck mm -hmm. in order to help someone else reach their goal. Mm -hmm. now, that's really what it boils down to. And typically an employer, in the past at least, has not been overly concerned about the financial, social well-being of the employee. Right. In other words, he's being paid to do the job, and that's about the extent of it. And the pay is what the job's worth, not what the individual's worth. Exactly. Yeah. Now, a business now is selling a business. Well, we have to look at a business. Uh, if you do well in business, it's great, but I'll tell you, most people don't. A real high percentage of people who go into business for themselves uh, even the home-based businesses is increasing in this area. The fact is that most of them don't make it. There's about a 90% uh, failure ratio in the first five years. And then out of those survivors, another 90% drops off in the next five, leaving about a net gain of yeah. about you know, 3 to 4%, yeah. which is not very healthy. Uh, now, this does not indict going into business, but it, we have to examine, are people prepared to do that? Um, there is a, a fellow named Gerber who is a business guru, and he says a lot of people who have enjoyed a hobby or developed a skill uh, will go into business for themselves in order to sell that service. And uh, they thought they were working for a dumbbell, but now they realize they're working for an idiot. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they don't know. See, just because you can do something well doesn't mean you're a business person. And there's another dimension. Now, why do businesses fail? Well, there's three primary reasons. Um, one is a lack of capital. They just don't have enough money. Right. Most typically, a uh, return on investment is anywhere from three to seven years, which means you should go in realizing you're not going to make a profit for that much, a time, much time while you build your business. And most people aren't prepared for that. Or if they go in with capital, they tend to dissipate it inappropriately. Or if they have a flush of capital, they oftentimes spend it on personal gain. I've seen time and time again over the years, bright young talents get into business, make some money, and buy a Jaguar. You know what I mean? Instead and then they buy a home. In yeah. And then they get in trouble. Uh, interestingly enough, too, you can succeed yourself out of business if you don't have enough capital. Mm -hmm. You can actually do so well that the demands are such that you have to increase personnel, property, whatever it happens to be. And, and then if not, it drops off, yeah. then you're out of business. You're not ready to grow That's right. when it's ready for you. So a lack of capital, a lack of expertise. A lot of people go into the business with a lack of expertise. Not in their specialty, but in people communication, business skills, this kind of thing. And that's not at all uncommon. The third reason, and the, probably the major reason that most businesses fail, is a lack of accounting. Uh, it's incredible how many businesses there are that have no real accounting system. They don't want to know the truth. They run out of their checkbook. And I'm, I've done that in the past. I mean, I know what that's like. But it's very, very dangerous. 
And uh, I know some years ago I went to work for a company that sold accounting services, one of the most challenging businesses I've ever been in. And uh, I realized that a lot of people either don't have accounts or don't want them. They don't want to know the truth. Some of the companies had not filed their taxes for five, six, seven, or eight years, not because they were dishonest, but they were overwhelmed. Right. They ended up with no right. money, and they were waiting for the windfall so they could catch up and, and in pure panic, you know what I mean? And didn't want an accountant coming in and embarrassing them, and so they were in trouble. You know what I mean? And so those are the primary reasons that businesses fail. And so is selling a business. Well, we'll have to come back and take a look. Uh, on the other hand, is it a profession? Say a profession uh, is something altogether different. There is a, an ethics and an excellence in a profession. And any times ethics and excellence are involved, you have a right to call it a profession. And yet you have to understand what a professional's life is really like. They get up in the morning thinking about it and doing it, and they go to bed doing it. What's the average work hours of a doctor, an attorney, and a CPA during season? I mean, there is no clock. They just work mm -hmm. around, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, this should be income commensurate with that, and I think there often is, uh, but it's tricky. If they have time off, they've got to take it. You know I mean, they've got to demand it. I think doctors, for example, might take a Wednesday, no matter what, boy, you can't get a hold of them. They've got someone taking care of things for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any time off at all. I know a, a professional real estate person who literally bought a condo in Mexico that it was one of those timeshare things, mm -hmm. and she purposely did it so she had to go at a certain time every year, otherwise she missed her vacation, and her peers and her clients understood that she had to leave then. Otherwise she'd never get away. They would demand that she stay so and take care of them. So out of her control. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so it's pretty tough. Yeah. And so we say is selling a, you know, a job, a business, or a profession. Now, for years, I will admit to taking a stand that selling is a profession. Ethics, excellence, income, you know, personal uh, authority and influence over your time and what have you. But I think it was a mistake. Really? Uh, yeah, I think it was a mistake. Uh, as time went on, I began to realize that the thing that makes selling so complex, now, I mean, let's face it, it's the highest paid of all if you can do it well, but the thing that makes it difficult for people is that it's essentially all three. And those, there are elements in selling that have to be regarded like a job, a business, and a profession. For example, um, in selling, <clears throat> if a person functions like the person who's going to lose the job, in other words, they start late and quit early. You know what I mean? They take long breaks. Mm -hmm. They pick up Aunt Mary at the airport. They're in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. You know, that selling position is in jeopardy. There's no question. You, you just really can't do that. Um, you show me a person, though, that punches his clock and regulates himself like he would on a regular job, his chances of succeeding or her chances of succeeding are going way, way up. Mm -hmm. no way. So there is that job. There. Yes. Mm -hmm. Expertise. Um, uh, oh, let's talk, let's talk about the capital and the business. What is the salesperson's capital? It's time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. See, the really successful people have recognized one thing, that time is a lot more valuable than money, a lot more valuable than money. Money can be borrowed. Money can be saved. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Money can be lost and found. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with time. Now, once that time slips by, it's gone, it's gone and you cannot recapture it. A call not made today cannot be made tomorrow because you should be making another call instead. Yes. You mean some call is not going to get done. And so the capital is, in, is intrigued. Most salespeople, if they would use their time like capital, for example, if you know that you want to make $100,000 a year, you know, for example, that's going to be $2,000 a month. I mean, a week, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. right? $2,000 a week. You're prepared to work 50 hours a week for it. That's $40 an hour, okay? And so if you take each hour and evaluate it, that if there was a muse hovering over your shoulder that would pay you every effective hour, okay? Now, you work from 9 to 10 on Monday morning, he gives you $40. You work from 10 to 11, he awards you with $40. But if you don't work from 11 to 12, he takes back 80 because essentially that's the way it works. See, once that hour is gone, now you've got to have a double hour somewhere down the line in order to catch up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize this, and it's devastating if you aren't conscious of time and use it predeterminately. You can't fall through and do what you normally do and be totally efficient. It has to be, this is what I'm about to do. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and now I do it. And so capital is re reflected by time. Expertise, the ability to communicate an idea. 
uh, to transfer a thought or a picture from one's mind into another mind so they understand exactly what you do. I know this, that if I can communicate with a prospect effectively so that they understand what I've got in the same way that I do, that in all probability, if I've done my job right and correlated that person with my product and service, I will have a sale 100% of the time. You know what I'm saying? In other yes. words, it's that ability to communicate. The willingness to be lyrical, okay, and dynamic and dramatic and professional. Terribly, terribly important. Understanding your product or your service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, accounting. This is fascinating. You see, <clears throat> my experience is that if you ask most salespeople at a given, at the, any part of a year to record his last 12 months, say, how'd you do this past year? And it's all fantastic. See, that's positive thinking. You say, yeah, but what did you really do? And they say, oh, I'm, I made about uh, 60000 okay? Um, now, we know that's not true. Oftentimes, they take their best month, which happened to be 5000 and multiply it by 12, or they take their best month and, I mean, the best week and multiply it by 50 in order to get that figure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Too often that's the case. But they make an estimate. You see, they didn't make 60,000. They made 57,840, or they made 62,000. Uh, but they don't know. There's a question mark, really, about how much hmm. they made. Mm -hmm. Most salespeople are surprised when they get their 1099. They don't realize they made that much or that little. I mean, it's really a surprise. And they say, okay, if you don't know exactly how much you made, uh, how many sales did you make last year? And that margin of guess is even bigger. You know what I mean? They, they know less about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think so. If you say, okay, if you don't know how many sales you made, how many presentations did you put on? And that is even further away still. They, they have no concept. And if you don't know how many people you presented your product to, how many people did you call on? How many calls did you initiate? And they're even further away. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, let me ask you this. If you said to a salesperson, how did you do this year? Oh, very well, thank you. And so, yeah, but how did you really do? Oh, well, if you really need to know, and they go to a little book, and they say, well, in the past 12 months, I have initiated 9,742 contacts. Now, on the surface, that goes, whoa, 9,742? But you know, that's only about 30 a day, well within the range of an average mm -hmm. salesperson. Mm -hmm. Now, Mama told us not to talk to strangers. That's the problem. To go out and initiate contact, uh, to, that takes initiative. Okay. Now, out of those 9,742 contacts, he says, I actually got to talk, you know, actually visit with 7,112 mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. And out of that 7,112 people, I found 647 prospects. This is people who could buy. He knows they had the money, they had the perceived need, mm -hmm. okay, and they could make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I explained my product to them. Those were my presentations, and out of that, I sold 214 sales. My average sale was X number of dollars. I was on a certain percentage, and so I made $87,472. Oh, and if you must know, 15 cents. How many salespeople can do that? So, I mean, very, very few. I have known some, and in every single case, they excelled. This is the key. Um, Earlier, I blew, well, actually in the last show, I said that uh, everyone wants security, and it certainly is in selling, providing there is stability. What that means is doing essentially the same thing day in and day mm -hmm. out like you would at any profession, any business, any job if you're going to be successful. Uh, that comes only, that stability only can come from statistics. If you don't know the statistics, if you don't know your criteria, this is a very emotional experience. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You don't know where you are. But if you've got the numbers, you know precisely where you are. What other profession or event or, or um, involvement job, I guess, if you would, or business, uh, knows these numbers? Sports. Absolutely. And that's why yeah. there is excellence there. They can reflect it. They can mm -hmm. measure it. They know exactly what to do. Um, the theater knows exactly what's going on. And the person has a real concise record of their background. And so where the big money is, you will find statistics like this. Stock market. Exactly. Everything. Yeah. yeah, you've got to be able to quantify it. Some years ago, a friend of mine worked for a, um, a storage company, you know, with a you know, public storage type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very impressed that every single night the home office knew of all the thousands upon thousands of storage units in the world, every single night they knew how many people had walked in to inquire, how many had moved out, how many people moved in, how much money was taken in in the whole world. I mean, that's just, I mean, to the penny. 
and uh, this is why they were successful. Mm -hmm. It's called, you know, staying in command of your business. Uh, terribly important. And so selling is like this. If you do these things and the things of the job, and selling can certainly be considered a profession because of the income and because of the excellence and the ethics that must be involved if you're going to be outstanding. And so it's all three. It's all three. And if a person treats it that way, there is no way, no way in the world uh, that they will not do well. Dorothea O'Brand, I mean, half a century ago, wrote a book, Wake Up and Live. Yes. And she said in her book that when you go into selling, you can go into it with the full assurance that it's impossible to fail. Impossible to fail. Now, it's easy to not do. See, that's where most people falter. Uh, they let time, big chunks of time, slip through their lives unused. And so they violate all of this. And they, they work by their emotion rather than by statistics. And all of a sudden, uh, selling becomes very, very difficult. Uh, there's another interesting relationship, too, um, in selling. I think I'll put this down here, if I may. Um, selling gets a bad rap in many ways. You know, in some cases, it's 80% uh, of the business comes out of 20% of the people. In the more difficult ones, like real estate and insurance, it's 90-10. And in multi-level marketing, it's 95-5. Um, again, this is not an indictment of those environments, but of our lack of preparation to mm -hmm. do it. Um, but these figures include certain relationships with people who entered the industry. For example, the industry is loaded with avocationists. Avocationists. Has a lot of vocationists. And a lot of professionals. A few professionals, I should say. Now, very quickly, you know, to kind of make the difference here. Avocationists means they come into the business to hide out. See, a lot of these people are spouses, perhaps, who, you know, husband or wife is working, and they say, look, you, I mean, I mean you, we need some extra money. Why don't you go get a job, you know? And so they don't want to punch a clock. They don't want to be confined to a workstation. You know, they don't want the discipline of it. And so they go out into the world, and they get into selling. They get into real estate, as an example. And, uh, gee, you got to dress good. You know, you got to have some nice clothes. Oh, and you got to have a nice car. I mean, you, know, you can't have an old ratty car if you're going to be in real estate or in selling. <laughs> oh, and then you got a nice office, and you got a desk and a water cooler. And, uh, gee, they have a bowling league, and, you know, they have a softball team. And once in a while, they go down and they go skiing as a group. You know, that's a great deal. No intention of working. <laughs> you know what I mean? In other words, yeah. It's, it's a club, a yeah, hobby. Yeah, and uh, they really kind of do everything they can to avoid actually doing the job. They just hang out. I've seen them. There's a lot of fear, though, don't you think? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that, but you can go into a real estate office and they'll have 60 desks. You know what I mean? I've, I've been in and out of them, and I know. Three of them are occupied. Yeah, there's three people. You, don't, you ever see more than four or five people? Yeah. And you figure, where are all these people? They're out knocking on doors? Yeah. You know, they're out there, you know, avoiding and these statistics include those people, and it's not fair, but there's room for them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's okay. The vocationists are a little bit more serious about it, but they treat selling like a job, mm -hmm. just like the job. Mm -hmm. In other words, they don't only really bother on Wednesday night, that's church night, and uh, they'd really rather have their weekends free. And I mean, in other words, they kind of punch in a clock, irrespective of the result, yeah. Yeah. and I'd rather have a vocationist hanging around than I would have a vocationist, but I think the avocationists should identify themselves because they could become authorities. They're the ones who say, I'll tell you, this business is tough. It takes two or three years to build a base. And, uh, oh, I wouldn't knock on doors. No, they that's not the way to do it. scare everyone off. Yeah, they yeah. scare people away. See? They do. They should wear a little sign, avocationist, and a bright new talent comes to them and say, uh, well, how, how should I handle this, or what do you do? And they should say, don't, don't talk to me. I'm an avocationist. Go over <laughs> I want to justify them. my inactivity. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, then the professional, they're the ones who get the job done. I mean, they wake up thinking about it, go to sleep thinking about it, take their time off, they're aware, they read, you know, this, this is the type of thing. And these are the ones who are getting these, almost exclusively. Now, these people will pop in with a sale here and there, and the avocationist might sign up Aunt Mary. And frankly, that's why they're tolerated a lot of times. You know what I mean? They kind of let them hang out because they might get a listing, they might make a sale that otherwise wouldn't be forthcoming. And so they're tolerated in the industry. Once in a while, some of these people will catch fire. Through osmosis, they begin to get a feeling of what really is going on, but frankly, not often. Uh, really? So, so a person has mm. to decide when they go into mm -hmm. it, you know, that's what they're going to do. Now, I will admit that a lot of this is due to the lack of preparation, to their anxiety, mm -hmm. to their stress, mm -hmm. and frankly, a lot of times, it's not so much to a lack of training, but a lack of coaching. I mean, no one is there with them. They don't see it done. 
uh, they're not really coached effectively, mm -hmm. and so that contributes to a lot of that. And they're not accountable, I think. Right. Oh, exactly. Yeah. If, if they had to count, if they had to turn those numbers into someone monthly, oh, exactly. I think it would make a huge difference. But you know, the funny thing about it is, I've, you know, I've been in sales leadership, sales management, if you would, and I have realized that I am not going to supervise these people into success, because you can't. They'll get aggravated. You have to inspire them into it. Right. You have to make that individual want to keep the record. Right. You know, he's doing right. it for his sake. Although I, I think it's the same as exercising. It's, you know, it's exactly. uh, really tough to get up and jog at 5 in the morning. Yep. But if you know your best bud's going to be out there waiting for you, mm -hmm. you're going to get up because there's no way you're going to let him show you up or call you and say, where were you? That's right. So, the bud is a taskmaster in a way yeah. because if you don't, he's going to bug you. And I do think that salespeople should align. Them. You've heard of Toastmasters? Uh -huh. I have a uh -huh. concept called Taskmasters where salespeople should assemble in groups that are unrelated. For example, to create a little mini organization uh, called a taskmaster group and say you've got a real estate person and an insurance agent and a stockbroker and a multi-level person and this person is selling, we'll say, copy machines, okay? And they get together once a week to make commitments to one another. Okay, now none of them can benefit from the other's success. All right. And so there's no feeling of being pushed inappropriately, whatever. And so they make commitments to one another, and then the following week they come back and support each other in completing the commitments. I call it task mastering, and yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. I was a member of a group some uh, years ago in another city, and I got things done that I've been putting off for years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, now, I will just admit, want to save face. Yeah, I will admit a couple times I went to a rage. I was so put upon by my peers. Because it takes some courage to put yeah. someone's feet to the fire or yeah. to allow them to do it to you. Yeah. Boy, it sure does get results. Because we've talked about before that the subconscious doesn't make a very good boss, and that's why a lot mm -hmm. of these people falter mm -hmm. and fail. And because they're just, they're accommodators, they're not used to moving forward mm -hmm. on their own, and that has to be addressed. You know, um, there's a feeling in the industry that is kind of like this. You know, up and down, feast and famine, rich and poor. And um, there's some reality to that, because that's the way salespeople function. Someone has a great week, they tend to take a few days off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or frankly, if they don't do anything at all, they take a few days off. Because why just waste your recover. time? Yeah, just to recover. <laughs> and what we're talking about is some principles here where if somehow we could find a way to cut off that peak mm -hmm. and jam it down into this valley, mm -hmm. okay? And cut off that peak and jam it into that valley and cut off that peak and jam it into this one, that there would be sort of a variety, but see what it would be. It would be at a higher plane. Mm -hmm. I remember a meeting I was uh, conducting in uh, Dallas, Texas some years ago, and I did a little survey around the room, knowing what the answers were, were going to be. And this was a performance for a national sales manager that was visiting us. And I remember saying, uh, Charlie, uh, uh, how much are you going to sell next week? And Charlie said, I don't know. You know, and the manager kind of looked, you know, because we do that in selling, you know. And I said, how about you, Ben? What are you going to do next week? He said, I have no idea. And I went all the way around the table and see no one would give me a figure. And the manager was like, I could just see that psychically he was pulling his hair out. So I said, okay, you guys, let's go back with them through this again. Charlie, how many calls are you going to put on? He said, I really have no way of controlling that. And Ben said the same thing, and, and, and so did Harris, and all the way around the table. And so I said, okay, let's do it right this time. And so I went to Charlie, and he says, I can promise Steve, who was the national sales manager, he said, every single day, every single day from 9 to 12, I will be prospecting. I can promise you that. And that out of that prospecting comes people who want to receive me, just typically. And out of those, I've been averaging pretty well. And so when we said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, last month I made $7,472. And the previous month I made $6,712. You, know, you know, this month I'm on schedule to make 8410 See, there was variety, certainly. But it was at a plane that was acceptable to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so it comes from... Uh, the application of oneself in a statistical, stable way that seems to make the difference. Um, we're going to move on, too, next week and continue with some of this uh, and to explain why some of this happens. We may have time to say this, that if this is a circle graph that represents all the sales that will ever be made, and you've heard me say this before, that 30% of those are going to be made just because you're there. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. I mean, we've all made them. You know, you, you walk into someone's home or their office and you happen to have a product or a service and they go, wow, you know, mm -hmm. that's for me. And it's almost discouraging. I mean, they took it away from me too easy. And another 55% of all the sales are made 
are going to be made because you care. This is because you're there, and this is because you care. And some of this we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. Wonderful. And how to get to that. And this other stuff down here, you don't have to worry too much about it because you get better and better and better as you apply yourself. Just as I hope we're doing.